Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In letter 47, Seneca is writing on something to his friend Lucilius that to us is a very controversial topic, and in his own time, other aspects of it were very controversial as well, as we see in the letter. And this is how people who are slaves ought to be treated. And we're not going to candy coat this and say, oh, well, they're merely servants, or you do have to understand that when we're talking about Greek and Roman slavery of the ancient world, we're not talking about antebellum uh, race-based slavery in the United States. I mean, there is an important difference between those, but as we see Seneca talking about, slaves were often treated in very terrible, cruel ways. And it, it was an arbitrary way of people having power over each other. Now, that said, you can apply this advice to all sorts of other matters where there's some sort of power and prestige differential. It doesn't just have to be ancient slavery. We could think about, you know, bosses who act tyrannically towards employees. We can think about people who are abusive within their own household with their spouses or children. We can think about all sorts of you know, power relations that approximate to servitude. Seneca is congratulating his friend for being a good master. And what that means is being in many ways less of a stereotypical master as many Romans of the time understood it. He, he talks about living on familiar terms with slaves. So familiater cum servis vivere, living, not just acting, not just doing one thing, but the entire scope of your common life together. And then there's this really interesting rhetorical passage. He's imagining somebody arguing with him. They are slaves. And then Seneca says, no, they are human beings, homines, right? So yes, they are slaves. They are in a position of slavery, but that's not what they are at their essence, at their core. First, they're human beings, and only after that are they slaves. They are slaves. No, they are housemates. They are the people who you live together with. You just happen to be in a dominant position in relation to them. They are slaves. No, they are low-born friends. He uses the word amici there, right? And low-born humiles. It could mean low-born. It could mean those who are placed in an inferior position. They are slaves. And here's where he gets to a really important point that we're going to come back to. No, they are your fellow slaves. You are all slaves of one sort, you just happen to emphasize the power relations and the ownership of another person, but you have the potential to be just as much a slave as they are. And he goes on and he talks about uh, Roman masters and how they typically treat their slave. He says, I laugh at those who think it is beneath them to share a meal with their slaves. Why not? 
There is but one reason. It's one of the traditions of arrogance for the master to eat his dinner with a crowd of slaves standing in a circle around him. He eats more than he can hold immense greed, loading his distended stomach, a stomach that's forgotten its proper function, merely so he can expend more effort on vomiting than he did on ingestion. Meanwhile, the poor slaves aren't allowed to move their lips even to to speak. Every murmur is curtailed by the rod, by physical violence used against them. And you can read the rest of the the discussion in this. I'm just going to bring up a few. The result is those same slaves who cannot speak in their master's presence are ready to speak about him to others. A little bit later, he says, I can hardly list all the cases of cruel and inhumane treatment, which would be abusive to beasts of burdens, let alone to human beings. When we recline at dinner, one is wiping up gobs of spit, another crawling under the couch to pick up the scraps the drunkards let fall. A third carves the expensive fowl. He lives only for the proper carving of of poultry. Another is the cupbearer, decked out like a woman and struggling against his years. He cannot escape boyhood. He's made to revert to it. And he says, his first shift is devoted to his master's drinking, his second to his lust. Another has been assigned to evaluate the guests. It's his task to stand there and observe which are the flatterers, which cannot control their gluttony or keep a watch on their tongues, right? So this is a slave who's actually having to watch human nature debased. And so he says, you know, this is the the kind of people that masters think they cannot bear to dine, thinking it beneath their dignity to come to the same table as his own slave. And Seneca is saying, this is just ridiculous. You, you masters are worse people than the slaves that you bend into all of these, you know, terrible shapes. And he talks about slaves not just being enemies, but being made into enemies. Masters make their own enemies, their hostess. They also are transforming the slaves into beasts of burden and worse than beasts of burden because they're, they're knowledgeable about what's happening to them into uh, as Aristotle called them, and sold tools, right? So Seneca says this is not the way you should behave. Instead, you should keep certain things in mind. And one of them, foremost, is the contingency of who happens to be a slave and who happens to be a master. A lot of people, when they have a position of power or social status or pick whatever else you want over somebody else, they mistakenly think that somehow they deserve it. If they were born into a uh, family with a lot of power or prestige or wealth, they think, ah, I am this sort. Not realizing that every one of those things could disappear and that reversals can take place. These are mere matters of fortune, as Seneca would say. And he reminds uh, Lucilius and all of us, reading these letters, reflect, if you will, the person you call a slave was born or arose orator out of the same seeds as you, enjoys the same sky, breathes, lives, dies just as you do. They are fundamentally and foremost a human being before being a slave, even if they were born into slavery. That's what really matters for Seneca. Uh, He also points out that anybody can end up as a slave. And this is one of the important differences between race-based slavery, say in the American South, and the slavery that we see all across the Mediterranean world, and indeed in most ancient societies that developed past a certain point, anybody could become a slave. You could become a slave by going into debt and having your debts Uh, bought out by somebody who now you're a slave to. You could become a slave through warfare. He gives a whole bunch of examples here. He says that um, at the time of Varus's disaster, many high-born nobles were laid low. Men who looked forward to a senatorial career after their military service, luck made one of them into a shepherd, another the guardian of a hut, the fortunes of, of those you despise may come upon you 
at any time. The position you hold, the prestige that you have, the good name that you have, the wealth that you have, the connections that you have, all of those could go away. You could wind up in a, as a slave, and sometimes slaves will become masters. Another thing that didn't happen in the American South, but did happen quite often in ancient Mediterranean society. He goes on and he says, um, every time that you remember the extent of power over a slave, remember your own master has that same amount over you. But I have no master, you say. Well, you're still young. Maybe someday you will. And he gives a few examples. Don't you realize how old Hecuba was when she became a slave? Don't you realize how old Croesus was? Now, Croesus was the king of Lydia, one of the richest men in the world. He fought against uh, the Persians under Cyrus the Great, lost and became a slave. The mother of Darius, Plato, Diogenes. Plato was taken captive by a tyrant and essentially, well, he wasn't officially a slave, but he's living at somebody else's behest. Diogenes was actually taken by pirates and sold as a slave. So it's, it's a possibility for any one of us, he's telling us, right? Now, um, this idea about masters, jumping ahead a little bit in this, we may not have physical masters, acknowledged masters, but it's possible for all of us to actually already have masters. He says, and this is in section 17, um, show me a person who isn't a slave. One person is a slave to lust, to sexual desire. That is what motivates them. That is what drives them. That is what forces them into making humiliating decisions that may in fact get them in all sorts of trouble. Another is a slave to greed, to wanting more and more and more. It could be money, it could be possessions, it could be whatever you want. Another, ambition. They want to have power. They want to have prestige. They want to be famous. They want celebrity. They need other people to say good things about them. If, from the Stoic perspective, you are being fundamentally driven by these things, you are already a slave. You are not actually free. You can own a house and have hundreds of slaves under you, but those things are driving you. And you're just as much a slave as any of them, perhaps even more so because they can have free minds. He talks about being a slave to other people. Just to give a few examples of this, an ex-consul who's a slave to a little old lady, a wealthy man who's a slave to a servant girl. I will show you young men of the best families who are the vassals of pantomime dancers. And then he concludes with this really great observation. No servitude, no slavery is more shameful, terpior. And shameful here doesn't just mean, ooh, embarrassing or something like that. Terpior has the sense of moral degradation, right? And notice what else he says, than that which we take on willingly. And here he uses the term voluntaria, of our own will. We choose to take on this slavery. We choose to be slaves. So if that's your case, you don't have anything over the people that you happen at this point in time to have power over. You're, in fact, perhaps more of a slave than them. Just to go back to the uh, unfortunate cupbearer, right? Uh, he's a boy only at the party. In the bedroom, he's a man. He's being compelled to satisfy the gluttony the desire for prestige, and the lust of the person who's driven by all three of these. And, you know, even though what he does is uh, from the outside degrading, if he has a free mind, perhaps he's less degraded than the master. Seneca is going to sketch out for us what he takes to be a better model, his own approach to those within his household and what he takes to be that of uh, Lu uh, Lucius, but also that of, as he says, um, earlier Romans and how 
they uh, treated people. So what is this, this better model? To live mercifully, clementer, right, with clemency. Seneca actually wrote an entire treatise on how one would do this. And amicably, comiter, in a way with allies, you could say, with people that you're going to be with, you should live that way with your slaves. You should structure your life this way with these people who you share a household with. So what does that mean? He gets a little bit more specific. Include them in conversation. Allow them to actually speak, right? Don't sew their lips up by either physically or by threatening them. Um, Include them in planning. Treat them as if they actually have minds that can be useful. Include them in meals. And he talks quite a lot about this. Uh, He says, don't you know what our ancestors did to eliminate uh, resentment towards masters and to uh, eliminate abuse towards slaves? They used the name father of the household for the master and household members for the slaves. They instituted a holiday when masters would share a meal with their slaves, not just to do so at that time, but that it was the custom on that day in particular. They allowed slaves to hold offices and pronounce judgments within the house, for they considered the house to be a polity in miniature. By the way, this echoes what Aristotle says in the Nicomachean Ethics, and as well, you could say to a certain extent, in the politics about the household, the oikos, that it should be understood not as a tyranny, a despotism of a master over servants, but rather a structured polity, a political association in a smaller way. And then, you know, he he, uh, deals with an objection that's going to come up. So wait a second, you're going to let stinky slaves come in from the stables and sit down next to you and eat? And Seneca says, well, yeah, not in every single case. As a matter of fact, there may be some people who have jobs that are, you know, nice, don't get them all sweaty and stuff like that, but they don't actually deserve a place at the table, except to learn how to behave as a decent human being. He says, shall I admit all my slaves to my table? No more than you admit all who are free. There's plenty of free people who you wouldn't let eat with you because they're jerks, because they're disgusting, because they haven't mastered what it means to be a human being. He says that you're wrong if you think I'm going to exclude some on the grounds that their work is less clean. I will evaluate them not by their jobs, ministeries, the things that they happen to be assigned as their tasks. I will not evaluate them by that, but instead by their character, moribus. Now, moribus is a term, it's the plural of most, which means something like a custom, a habit, a a temperament, a way of being, a disposition. And you put all of them together and you get somebody's character. So being greedy, being lustful, those are parts of a character. Those are, uh, in this case, mores that you would judge a person according to. And this is, by the way, mos is the term that's used to, to translate the Greek ethos, which we use to, to get the word ethics, right? Morality, Ethics both come from these terms. We evaluate somebody on their moral character, not on the job that they happen to have been stuck with and assigned. And so this provides us with a very important criterion. He does say, though, that um, let some dine with you because they're worthy of dining with you, others to make them worthy. So even if somebody doesn't have a good character, them spending time with you at the table, this is where the clemency, the mercy comes in, allows them to see like how people behave with each other and how they ought to behave themselves. So he's going to say, uh, to, to bring this to a close, it's important to uh, let your slaves respect you rather than fear you. These two different types of, of motivation. And so kolant 
is, is the term there. And it literally means to cultivate. It means to care for, to respect. You allow those who are your uh, subservient uh, servants, slaves in this case, to do their task towards you. You're not saying, ah, everybody's completely equal. I can do everything on my own. But you leave it up to them rather than forcing them through fear, timeant, right? Um, you don't want them to be motivated solely by that because as soon as they stop fearing you, they're not going to respect you at all. As a matter of fact, it's difficult to respect and fear at the same time. And Seneca is going to say, um, this is because respect and love are connected together. He says, um, yeah, here we go. One who is respected is also loved and love and fear do not mix. Thus, I think you are doing the right thing when you prefer not to be feared by your slaves. And when you correct them, because you will have to correct them at times, everybody needs correction, including those who happen to be lucky enough to be a master. When you correct them only with words, why? Whips are for training speechless animals. Violence and the threat of violence is not a sufficient way to produce good character, which is what you're looking for in people that you're going to be living with. So Seneca doesn't suggest getting rid of the institution of slavery. Many people fault him and the other Stoic philosophers from the ancient period for that. But what he is sketching out here really does reflect a very different attitude and understanding of slavery uh, than many other people of his time had. And he is suggesting it as not just an alternative model, but the right model for the relationship between the people who, for the time being, happen to be masters and those who happen to be slaves, how they ought to live together on familiar terms.